Well, hello, everyone. It is Tuesday again. <laughs> it's Groundhog Day, Larry. Uh, welcome to the MSP Initiative. Um, we have good friend uh, and uh, constant face in the T circles, Larry Cobrin from uh, MSP CFO. Larry, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm great, George. Thanks for having me on the call. Awesome. Where are you, uh, where are you based, Larry? I am up in uh, I am up in Connecticut, so right now I'm fortunate that it is a beautiful day. Yeah, the weather's finally starting to get nice on the Northeast. Unfortunately, we're we're still on the tail end of, I mean, lockdown time, right? Probably. Yeah, um, they're starting to open up up here. I'm hoping for. I, I see okay. you've already gotten it. I'm hoping for my haircut soon. Well, that's good because, you know, the barbers seem to, like, be the guys that got, got really screwed in the whole thing and the hairdressers and such. Um, so, right on. Well, that's good. I mean, everybody's been cooped up. How has the uh, – how has quarantine been for you, right? I mean, both personally from a working standpoint and then you own your business, right? Uh, how, how has that whole process been, you know, throughout the entire uh, government programs and all that jazz? Uh, so let's unpack that. First, uh, quarantining has been fine. I've been, you know, with my wife and three daughters and dog, which is great. I work out of the house. So that really didn't change, except now I have four new office mates. Usually I get the house to myself during the day. Um, so that's been fine. Uh, you know, I, as I like to say, I think as a family, we fight about the right amount. Um, and, in, <laughs> and in terms of, uh, in terms of, um, the government programs and all that, you know, I've become an expert of reading treasury department websites and you got a familiarity with the SBA that I did not have previously. Yourself? How, how yeah. you uh, actually it's, it's all right. Uh, here in suburban Philadelphia, I'm not in Philly proper. So, you know, didn't have uh, any problems with lockdowns and curfews and quarantines and such. So kind of been lucky there. Uh, you know, the, they finally lifted restaurant and stuff restrictions. So, you know, we were able to finally go kind of like hang out with the friends outside at a local place and, you know, have a few beers, which is nice. So uh, it's been nice to kind of unwind a little bit. Not that we haven't been able to just go and do takeout and stuff like that the whole time, but you know. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of done with cooking. Yeah. Totally understand. So, um, today's topic's an interesting one, right? Cause, um, everybody all over the place with, you know, where does this go? How, how long does the money last? Um, how many employees can I retain? Right? Like there's just a lot of, uh, I guess, question marks, right? Some people were, you know, okay. And other people maybe got hit a little bit worse than others, depending on, you know, what, what um, verticals their end customers were in kind of thing. So um, Larry, before I get too deep into the, you know, the main topic, uh, why don't you go ahead and give the audience a little bit of your background? Because you actually come from the financial services industry, I think, and you've been, you know, on the on the math side of things. So I'd love for everyone to understand where you come from. Yeah, sure. So my background is sort of a, a journeyman's experience. I've worked in, oh gosh, consulting, investment banking. I worked at a private equity fund. I worked at a, a hedge fund, and, and here I am now. Um, I say this in all sincerity. I've never had a job as I've enjoyed as much as the one I'm doing now. Um, and you know, I had the good pleasure of, it was funny. I, I used to think about it of working at Citigroup in 2008 when the financial markets just pretty much the world stopped spinning on its axis from a finance perspective. And we used to talk to people and we said, listen, you have to get through this and prepare for the next one. And I said, I have no idea what the next one is. Who would have thought that, you know, the mortgage debt securities would have caused 2008 when the last one happened, when, when September 11th happened, the last crisis. And who would have thought in 2008 that there would have been a pandemic that shut down our society? So, I mean, okay. it just goes to show you, I don't know what the next crisis will be. Unfortunately, we'll probably hit in the next 10 years or so. Um, and you kind of just have to be prepared for anything. If you're a prepper and you had guns in the basement, you didn't really prepare for the right ones. So you kind of just got to need to prepare in general. Be broadly are ready for it. Um, yeah. Interesting. Wow. That, that's a, uh, you've already put out the 10 year, you know, uh, prosecution <laughs> i guess everybody needs to think about that it it just happens all the time um something happens that's a shock to the system every 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 decade or so you know it might be seven years it might be 12 years 
it's going to happen again. You know, I remember when I was younger and, and somebody, you know, I, I got a couple of years on you. So when I was coming out of school, some of the older people were, you know, had lived through the, the um, Great Depression. And, you know, when I came out of school, it was in the late 80s and there was a stock market crash, the biggest one we ever thought happened back then. And the guys who were older were like, yeah, this happens. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. This never happens, but it does. And what we're going through now, it happens. And we as a country, we as a business community, we're resilient. We will, we use our head, we'll, we'll get through this. Hopefully most of us will, not everybody. And then that's quite unfortunate. And then it's gonna happen again. So the, the idea is really just to learn. So back in 2000 and financial crisis, you weren't necessarily in the MSP IT circle. You were, you know, you were in the finance sector, right? Yeah, I was. I worked at, I worked at Citigroup. I worked uh, in the wealth management group. I worked with, uh, corporate brokers who sold products to, uh, to large companies. And the, one of the products they sold just stopped existing. And most of the companies that worked with them had a very tough year and they got through it. Interesting. So about when did you get into the MSP CFO, IT owners and MSP consulting type thing? So um, euphemistically speaking, uh, in 2010, uh, still from 2008, I was, as I like to say, given the opportunity to spend more time with my family and I was just trying to figure out where to go. And there was somebody I'd worked with at City. Actually, we, our group had been sold to Morgan Stanley. So I worked with her at Morgan Stanley and she was at a startup and she just looked happier than anybody I've ever seen. And I thought, why would I go back to a big bank where it really was unpleasant and political I got to try doing this. So I did a startup for about six months. Uh, I worked with somebody helping out with a healthcare startup. Uh, that one didn't work out. And then, you know, it was really a friend from, of my wife's from her summer camp. And he said he had an idea. He was an MSP owner. I didn't know much about the space other than that existed. So I kind of came to this fresh. Been doing it for a while. I don't consider myself that fresh anymore. But we started by figuring out there was a need to help MSPs understand how to improve their business. So... We're going to get into the main topic in a second, but MSPFO, the main gist of what your software company does today for MSPs is what? So it, it, in, in the fewest words possible, it's business intelligence. Um, to spread that out a little, if you look at the CFO function, there's really three parts of it. One part is sort of your um, bookkeeping side where you, you know, basically maintain QuickBooks. Another part, it, part of it is sort of the strategy where you do the M&A and you negotiate as the financial person as part of the leadership team. And the other part, the one that, we don't do either one of those. The other part is the analytics, providing the information and the, the research and the analysis to say, listen, if we wanna make an improvement in our business, I'm gonna focus on this one part because that's where I can get an outsized return on my effort. I'm not gonna boil the ocean. I'm not gonna fix the entire business. I have a problem here. If I fix this problem here, it'll fix everything. Um, and that's really what MSP CFO does. We look at um, an MSP and if they use their PSA properly, we can get all the data we need to see which agreements, which clients, which projects or engineers may be the specific situations they need to look at. Okay, that's interesting because those are big questions that often go a long time unanswered. So very interesting. So zooming in now to 2020, right? 2019, you had, you probably had a lot of partners and partners and MSPs that were doing pretty well at the end of the year, right? Yeah. Um, and then Q1 2020, different story, and we we're still in it, right? So first of all, can you give us a, an overview of the you know gist of what the majority of the people that you're working with today are feeling? Um, and then let's get into you know what does that mean from a cash flow, finances, like plan kind of thing. Sure. So I, I will tell you that what they're feeling now, it, it kind of depends where they're on. And a lot of them are, you know, we've, we've all aged a lot in the past three months where they are on this journey of getting through the COVID crisis. And there's a couple of different issues. One is the clients that serve verticals that are getting hit hard. We have clients that service hospitality and tourism. They're not doing well. They obviously are, they're getting shut down. They're getting hit by the lockdown hard. Um, their business model was great. Their service delivery was great. They're just very unfortunate that they are the ones that got hit on this one. Uh, we have one that does a lot of projects for hotels. They're just not doing outstanding. But when you get past that, um, the clients aren't really doing that bad. 
we looked at the revenue of our clients in the month of April and we compared it to the average of the first three months of this year. And what we found is pretty much two thirds of them either saw almost no decline in revenue or a growth in revenue, recurring revenue. Hmm. So the recurring business, obviously there's a third that took a hit, but a third isn't everybody. I mean, this is the pandemic. This is a global shutdown. This isn't everybody. Some took a hit. But two thirds of them saw you know, less than a 2% decline or the companies were growing, which is actually pretty good. Where they all took a hit is on the more, it's called transactional side of the business. The project work has slowed down. The physical product sales have slowed down. Um, and that's even taken into consideration that I'm sure you couldn't find a laptop in a you know, Best Buy for probably five, six weeks. All those were sold and that even with that, the, there was a slowdown there. Um, hopefully, we'll see that start to pick up. We're going to start looking at, at May numbers and see how those improved over April. Um, so broadly speaking, the business has a sense of stability to it. Hmm, that's we're not, we're not the rest of it. News. Yeah, no, it, it well, is great. I, yeah. um, I, I'll be honest with you. I was waiting for you to say that you had a lot of people that were on the, on the edge and like, you know, wondering whether they need to cut headcount or not. But well, the reverse sounds like what's going on. Well, no, that's the thing. Then it the question becomes, what's the journey? Where are they on the journey? So I will tell you, I was pretty much in the same position they were in. On March 15th, Connecticut shut down on March 11th, I think Pennsylvania right about the same time. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't know which way we were going. Uh, I had just hired a new person. Uh, he was working out great as a marketing person. You know, it's the kind of thing you make an investment in, it pays off over time. Um, and he was great, he is great, he's still with us. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, all my clients are gonna leave. And we're not like Beloit, we're not a sell through, we're not something our clients buy and, and, and keep going, we're a sell too. So the MSP utilize us and they may make a decision that, you know, if the ship's sinking, they're gonna start throwing off some weight. I'd like to think that we add value, but you know, we did have a fair amount of attrition in the short term because they were doing what we were doing. At the front end, we just didn't know what would happen and they were cutting costs and they were doing it more instinctively than with a model. And we had attrition probably over the course of four or five weeks. Every couple of days, a client would say, listen, I want to go on pause. And we, we were always considerate about it. We didn't hold anybody to any contractual issues. We tried to make accommodations where we could. Um, and then it's kind of died down. And I think that's where companies did what we were strongly advocating they're doing. And we've done, and we hope everyone hope that you guys have done it as well. And that is the first thing that you need to do. Once you've like stabilized and you can catch your breath, you build a financial model. Every one of the MSPs should always have a model. They should know what money they have to invest for the year. I mean, I know you and I, we talk when we go to the conferences and you talk about, listen, this is what I'm going to spend on marketing this year. You and I see each other at conferences. You spend money to be there and you know which conferences you can afford and you can't afford. You know that in November for the coming year. And I'm sure the MSPs have an idea of how they're going to staff and how they're going to manage their business in the coming year. All that changed. They needed to build a new model because they didn't commit to all their expenses. And they need to understand, well, listen, are we not going to have the capacity to pay all our headcount? Thankfully, PPP came through for a lot of companies. Uh, there's the EIDL grants and the IDL loans, all outstanding. So they start to say, well, listen, if I was, gosh, making $50,000 a month in EBITDA, and I think for the next three or four months, I'm probably going to make $10,000 in EBITDA, that sucks, but I'm not losing money. I'm not going to miss a payment. I can continue my business where it is versus I'm afraid of everything. I have to shut down and I have to throw off the weight that's actually providing value. That's where we started to see some of our, our sophisticated clients um, make good decisions. Um, mm. And we, we hope that everybody does, you know, figure out, like if you have a lot of project business, you're probably not going on site to, to fix business, fix, fix work. If a lot of your business is on-site work, it's probably going to go on hold for a little while and the client might ask for a reduction. If you have a lot of hospitality clients, you're going to take a hit. A lot of restaurant clients are probably going to take a hit. Understand that. Build the new model and say, well, you know what? If I have 30% less work, I have to think about my staffing. And that's where some of our clients started to ask us very good questions that we tried to help them with. So for the people who are watching this, whenever they watch this, what if they don't have a working model, Larry? Is this an Excel sheet? Like, what is this model? I mean, anything's better than nothing. 
Um, this is when they sort of, you get those rewards for having, if you're part of a peer group or you're otherwise required to submit your PLs, this is where you're rewarded for having a clean PL with, you know, I'll, I'll use as an example, although it's not the only way to do it, a good service leadership chart of accounts, because that gives you the framework to say, let's just project that next year and then we'll take some haircuts. You can make it more robust to say, I'm not going to take 10% off of my recurring revenue. I'm going to take 20% off my restaurants and I'm going to take nothing off of my essential services or even up that. You can really make it as robust as you want, but anything's better than nothing. And then from sure. there. So, you, so, don't, so, so main takeaway here, peer groups are great and don't wing it. No. And, and the problem is like, this is a growth industry. A lot of people were winging it and successfully winging it. And sure. other people are like, Oh, why are you building spreadsheets? Everything's great. I just, I just keep selling. I keep making more money. Yeah, your revenue's growing, but as I said, what happens, what happened this spring and still not done with it yet, it's going to happen again. Hopefully, and I know a lot of these people, they're exiting their business at some point, maybe they won't be there. These are good habits. And now we are all a little bit older. We've now lived through one, maybe two of these. It helps having a good plan so that you can be smart as you work your way through it. So, so good bookkeeping, good, you know, you know, math and accounting, right? It's the foundation to the model, right? And then we can figure out from there, chart of accounts and where our money is going out the year before versus the next year. So, you know, this is interesting because, you know, risk is a, it's, it's a word that t touches people differently, right? So how do you determine risk as an MSP? Like when you were reevaluating post this shutdown time, where do you, you know, you're going and you're saying, all right, well, to your point, I have customers that, you know, are, are completely out, you know, from a hospitality standpoint, like after you talk to all your customers and you determine where you stand, did you, like, did your customers go out and determine, all right, this amount of my customer base is really, eh, you know, in a position where it could go either way. Like, how do you, how do you really look at that risk, you know, evaluation and determine where to cut back? Right. So when people built their models, I, 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 and I think you have the same benefit. There, there are some things I say over and over again, and this is one of them that I'll repeat. I'm a fairly smart guy. My client base collectively is a genius. They have come to us with some amazing questions that I would never have thought of. And we were able to incorporate that into analysis that we then shared with our community. They looked at things like, I want to understand where my risks are. So why don't we take a look at ticket count? If ticket count is okay. declining, the client's shopping me. The client is probably going out of business or winding down. And in this case, there's a lot of people that are less busy. So we did an analysis for these people of who had declining ticket counts over a you know, multi-week period. Those are people they could consider to be at risk. Okay. Then we asked them to take a look. Yeah, then we also asked them to take a look at their, their verticals. Um, in the PSA, you can tag verticals for clients. And we said, you know, now that you have your verticals, why don't we assign a risk by vertical? Again, not to pick on them, but, you know, if you had a cruise ship, that would be a high risk. If you had a essential business, that would be a low risk of government service. And then you could say, well, taking all that, let's do, you know, a, a best case, worst case, average case scenario across industries and see in total what's going to change. There's different ways to cut at it, but it, it made for some very interesting analyses to say, based on where everything is, this is what I think is going to happen. And it's, it's an educated uh, stab at it. Sure. Would you say that, you know, I know that this is a wide question, but, you know, you know, there's some people who are, you know, more averse to risk versus some people who are like, hey, let's roll the dice. Is there... You know, for the guy that's on either end of that spectrum, I would hope a lot of people are probably conservative based on this time, but the people who are a little bit more, let's roll the dice and see what happens. What were they saying to you from a risk standpoint? You know, I don't want to say they're rolling the dice because I, I consider somebody who's rolling the dice as somebody who say, listen, I'll roll the dice. I can make a couple of mistakes and a couple of things will work out, but I have enough money. I have enough cash flow that I can make a mistake. I don't think people really have the business feels visibility to make mistakes right now. Um, unless you're a communication seller who everybody's buying or you're Zoom <laughs> or something. But I'm, I'm not. Right. 
So y- there's fewer people making mistakes. There are people that were more aggressively attacking the risk. I, I would put it that way saying, I really want to understand what's at risk. I want to dive into it and say, well, I, I see a risk coming down the pike and I'm going to address that. So, okay. yeah, th- there are people that embraced it a little more fully and other people just said, you know what, I'm going to play conservative and I don't care what's going to happen. There's no way that's, that um, I'm going to get hurt if I just play fully conservative. And they are, because they're going to cut too deep. So other than headcount, where are the areas where people would cut back on? Is it marketing? Is it sales? Like obviously events stopped, but like where were the, the major categories where people cut back? So there was an overhead aspect. That, I mean, this is what we hear um, anecdotally because we don't really get involved in operations, just what we talk to our clients. They've had some cutbacks in obviously owner comp. They've had cutbacks in overhead expenses. Um, and a lot of it is client facing, you know, cutbacks and restaffing and re-understanding what resources they need to be able to service their clients. And we've gotten a lot of information, a lot of feedback saying, listen, can you help me understand what I need for staffing now versus what I might've needed in January? So did you, I mean, for, for the people that were, you saw, Hey, business was either steady or growing. I assume they maybe added people in some cases. Yeah, they, they did. Um, that's, a, that's our understanding. I mean, you, you, it, there's always a little bit of a lag, you know, business grows and you catch up and you, you're, your people work overtime and then they come back. I think in this situation, where we were in, in the end of March and April is so different than where we were in January. And it, I just don't know where we're going to be in July. So you kind of want to, you want to stay on the conservative side and you want to sort of ratchet up slowly. Um, I would argue to, to, because who knows if, if there's a second wave that comes through, if there's not a second wave and we open up faster than we thought we would have, we don't know the answer to that question. So you kind of want to give yourself options. And somebody always said, uh, what's the quote? I actually heard this in an evolved meeting, hire slow, fire fast. Mm. So I think that a lot of them are taking that approach. So if you're the business owner or finance person for an MSP today, what would you say in terms of cash flow you should have them concentrate on? Well, first of all, I focus on receivables. Um, that's a, you know, there's two issues that people are really focusing on from a finance side of it. One is, are my clients going to stay in business? Am I, I going to stay my clients? Number two, and that's a very real issue. And number two is the clients that owe me money. They're probably going through the same you know, mental exercises that I'm going through as to who can I afford to pay and who can give me a little bit of extra leg room, a leeway rather. So they're looking a lot at receivables for that second question. Who's stretching on that? Uh, we had some feedback from clients. You know, we want some more analysis in this. We built something into our system. And there's really two questions. Um, who's always been paying you slow? Is there somebody that you get a, a fixed fee agreement, a, a monthly recurring revenue for, for, managed services and they pay you in 10 days every single month and does somebody pay you in 45 days? Now's not a bad time to have a conversation with the 45 day person and say, listen, let's think about moving this towards 20 days. What can we do to make this easier for you to pay in a timely manner? Because it might've been fine to float them before. You might now say, listen, this is what we're going to do. Or we're going to do like a, 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 one and a half percent finance charge if you're over 30 days and start to enforce that. You don't want to be jerks to your clients because they're probably going through hardships as well, but you do have to recognize they owe you money. And the second thing that people have been looking at is, well, all that being the case, um, who's stretching me now? Who used to pay me in 10 days? It's now paying me in 30. Cause you got to understand that if somebody paid you in 10 days and now paying you in 30, they're slow paying you. And that might be because they're at risk you have to decide how you're going to treat that. If you have the ability to say, listen, this is somebody going through a hard time, they'll recover. That's a decision you can make. Or you can say, this is a client that might go out of business. And then you have to have these really difficult internal discussions. You know, are we going to cut them off from Microsoft? You're writing a check to third part, to all sorts of third parties. If they're not paying you, are you going to be holding the bag to continue to pay for their services that they can't pay you for? These aren't easy conversations, but these are things that MSPs have to think about. 
are you going to change the level of, of, of service? Are you going to switch them to, to, you know, if they want it, it's, they have to pay up front. Um, I, these are owner discussions. We want to highlight what they should look at and then they have to make that decision. Um, because you do, as I said, you, you, from what are they staring at? They're staring at their, their, their cash. They need to make payroll. They need to pay their rent. And if people aren't paying them, there's nothing they can pay with. Um, thanks, so, and the government money is going to run out at some point. For sure. So, you know, maybe this is more hypothetical, but I'll throw it out there anyway. So the whole purpose of PPP and maybe IDLE was to give you a bridge to come out of this, right? And do you feel that a majority of the people you're working with, but, you know, at the very tail end of this period, this cover period, you know, they're, that's, you know, they're at the end of the boat and they're just going to have to cut people at that point after the PPP runs out? Or do you think that, generally speaking, to your point, you said some, everybody's kind of been flat or maybe even growing in some cases, and a third of the guys may have been at risk. Like, what is the gut feel on headcount change in Q3? Oh, gosh. Um, see, it's interesting. If, if I, I'm not an MSP owner, so... Um, What I would say is PPP is set up for MSPs. It's set up to cover payroll and MSPs largely, they're one of their largest expenses is headcount. You know, it's much better than somebody who has to pay a lot of rent PPP, although they, they've adapted, it really wasn't set up for that. So it really covered MSPs pretty well for eight weeks. But again, this bill was written in the course of a weekend, I think, you know, they didn't know how long it was going to last. It was amazing they got it done. There was plenty of flaws in it, but getting it done in a week, that's amazing. So I think it really puts them in decent position. The question they have to ask themselves is what kind of staffing do I need? You know, if you had 10 people because you were servicing, I don't know, let's call it 70 clients, and you think you're going to be servicing 50 clients on the other side of this, you have to make that decision, you know, as a business owner, do I need 10 people? It's a decision that I went through as a business owner. I'm sure it's a decision that you considered as a business owner. It's not really just that I need to keep people employed. I need to run the business in a way that makes sense. And if I have more people than I need for my business, that's not good for the business. Um, we were fortunate we didn't have to let anybody go, but other people, if they, see that their business is not growing or they had a large portion of the business that was project work and the project work just isn't coming back, which I think it will for most clients. Um, they have to decide whether the staffing they had is the staffing they need. So I think that um, there's going to be some decline in staffing because I, I do believe a lot of small businesses, unfortunately, are going to go under. It's not about the MSPs, it's about the clients. Yeah. So you've, you know, you've said it earlier, but I'm going to come back to it. So I feel like the general consensus out in the world is that the MSPs really feel the ripple effect of what's happening now, like six to eight months down the line, right? By the time it like matriculates through. Do you feel that's accurate or? A hundred percent. So if you read the newspaper, they talk about the second phase, second wave. They're talking about people getting sick. Before we think about that, and obviously that's a tremendous thing to, to keep on your mind, there's another second wave. You know, the small restaurant went out of business in a week because you realized you couldn't operate. The second wave that I, I'm worried about for the MSP space is when PPP runs out and you've, it's gone past the eight weeks and whatever it's helped you, you know, not for the MSPs, but for their clients, it's just not enough anymore. And they have to downsize because the economy's smaller and the economy will be smaller on the other side of this. I, Quite frankly, I cannot make sense of the stock market. It makes zero sense to me that the stock market is at where it was basically at 3% unemployment as it is at 13.5% unemployment. It doesn't make sense in any way whatsoever. I've read some articles that are putting pieces together, but it, it still doesn't like, oh, it's because Amazon is the whole market. I'm not fully buying that. Um, that bonds are such lousy investments. People put it, whatever. On the other side of this, I am worried about the second wave of business damage, and that is when the small businesses can't survive. And the government cannot pay the bills indefinitely. It was yeah. extraordinary what they did. I really hope we don't have to go through it, but that's my fear. And that contraction and just the U.S. economy. 
So for the people that are aggressively trying to do things now to maybe benefit in the Q3, you know, we're in Q3, Q, you know, tail end of Q3 into Q4 and beyond, you know, we're hearing a lot of people saying, hey, double down on marketing, double down on sales efforts. Um, do you think that that's risky from a cash flow standpoint? It's hard to say. Um, I, th I think from, listen, from where I'm coming from, and you, you, a hammer always sees the world as a nail, um, I would say that you want to look at which clients are more or less profitable. At the end of the day, it's about the bottom line. It's not about top line. Um, so, you know, you'd rather, I'd rather see a company that's a 20% margin company at 2 million in revenue than a 5% margin company at, you know, $3 million in revenue. So rather than chasing sales, they should really take a moment and figure out how they can maximize their profitability, figure out which clients are better or worse, what they can do to fix that. Um, doubling down on marketing. I guess I'm not the right person to answer that. I, I know from my perspective and you and I, I market through travel. I market because I'm on the road. I haven't been on the road in a long time. Um, I probably won't be on the road for a long time. So I have to change my marketing standpoint. Um, I, I'm spending different on marketing. I'm experimenting with marketing. So for an MSP, I, I really don't know. I, I, there are smarter people than me that could answer that question. Fair enough. So from a pro let's, let's, let's dig into that topic a little bit more. Cause I think that's really the, the big, you know, takeaway or one of the big takeaways so far is that how do you like best in class MSP is what 20% to the bottom line. Did I get um, somewhere around there? So let's call that. Yeah. Okay. Somewhere so, so the people who are doing at least that and above, how are they getting, like, what's their profitability look like on average per customer versus the guys that are just average? Like, how do you, what is the, the big swing between a super profitable customer and I'm just breaking even or even losing money? Like, how do you, this where's is, the math? There? The math there is that if you're just breaking even, there isn't a super bright future for you because this is going to be a hit. And if you can't, like we talked about the company going from 50 down to 10, if you're at five, you're probably going to take a hit. Um, and that puts you in the point where it's a little bit low. So, so, so when you look at client profitability, obviously you're looking at hard, costs, you know, like office three, six, five and antivirus and all that other stuff, right? The SaaS subscriptions, but then, What's the, how do you factor the labor rate, right? Is it just number of tickets per customer per month or like, how do you determine the actual profitability on a client by client basis? So we don't actually do it by, we, we don't advocate doing it by margin. Um, the reason we don't do that is because margin could be deceptive. Let's, and, and this is one of the first conversations I had with um, an MSP. It's been long enough. I'll just use first names now in case he doesn't want me to talk about them. Uh, I met him at a, at back when it was HTG, maybe five years ago, we were sitting at the bar and we were just chit chatting and he was talking about a project that he was doing, large project. And the clients wanted a million dollars in hardware. Let's call it a million. And he's like, I don't know if I should do it. It's 5% margin. And I said, well, yeah, that, that is fairly low margin. If you're looking for 20% gross profit, that's going to, you know, that's going to be a hit, but answer me this how much work is it going to take for you to get that 5% margin? He's like, well, not that much. We spec out one machine and just do, you know, 40 machines or whatever, whatever the number was. Um, it's probably gonna take like four or five hours work, maybe 10. I'm like, okay, so you're gonna have to float the money. He goes, no, 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 they're, they're going to pay us up front. And we we'll probably actually pay the vendor a month after we get our money. So they actually get negative float, which is great. And I said, so you're gonna make 50 grand on this 5% of a million. And it's gonna take you 10 hours. I do that all day long. And if you look at it on a gross profit perspective, yeah, they're killing their numbers. They're bringing down gross profit. If you look at it, the money they're making for their investment of time, that's outstanding. So we kind of live on that theory. How much money are you making based on, um, how much money are you making based on hour you invest on a client? And that way you don't really get hurt by selling them lots of product. 
because you can always sell them lots of product or lots of recurring licenses, recurring licenses, which might be like set it and forget it. You never really have to touch them. And that's free margin, not free margin, but no work margin. That just makes it look like a better client. So we always look at it. We call it, you know, it's gross profit per hour. We use a number, which I get yelled at all the time. We'd call it contribution per hour. How much is that client contributing to your gross profit per hour you invest in that client? And we recommend so people, it's, it's a great way to compare different clients at different sizes because bigger clients will make more money and have more hours. So in order to actually make this math, this contribution per hour, you have to have some pretty close time record keeping, right? I mean, if you're not putting your time into this. I mean, you know, I talked a little bit before about the clients that were doing better versus doing worse. And I, I think that we are very fortunate in the sense that if the clients that we work with are pretty good timekeepers from a, a maturity level, they might be, they skew a little bit higher than average, I would think. Um, but yes, you have to have your time. And again, this goes back to, it's easier to build a budget if the whole time you were had a, had a, a proper step start of accounts and we're following it along and said, I can now look at this and say, which numbers are going to go up and down. The same is true of having to deal with good versus bad clients. If you put your invoices in and you parse out your additions properly and you enter all your time in and use a payroll wrap to make sure that you have a higher eight hours a day in the system, you can then look back and say, well, now I have a really good way to know which clients are good or bad. If you don't put your time in the PSA, if you don't invoice well, you're kind of stuck without the ability to know which clients are better or worse. Yeah. Um, one of the problems that we, we talk to new clients about is if you look at your, um, your agreements, there are some agreements that are outstanding, the client never calls you. And they pay you good money every month and they're fairly fond of you for whatever reason. And they're clients that just overutilize you or you're undercharging. You have a portfolio of clients. Some are very bad, some are very good. And it's like a distribution. On average, it might be fine. On average, you might be getting the target effective hourly rate you were shooting for. If you want to make 150 an hour, maybe you have $30,000 of revenue and you have, what would that be, 200 hours. That's great, I'm hitting my numbers. I don't have to worry about my agreements. But that's probably because you have some lousy clients and it's probably because you have some outstanding clients. And if you focus on the lousy ones, just three or four of them, maybe even fewer, you might be able to bring up your overall gross profit because you're fixing one or two relationships. And the ones that are outstanding, they are outstanding, but they're also flight risks. Because eventually they're gonna sit down and they're gonna say, well, I'm paying this guy two grand a month. I think I've spoken to him once every other month. It seems like a lot. And God bless our partners. Maybe they set up our clients, or other, the MSP CFO clients, maybe they set up the best stack. It's, it's infallible. Clients don't care. They don't care past six months. They want to know that they're always paying for a service. Fine, I'll pay you to set up the stack and then I'll pay you much less because I never call you. So those are the ones you have to protect. And if you don't focus on the margins, the really bad ones and the really good ones, then you're losing an opportunity to improve part of your business by looking at a couple of relationships and you're living with a certain amount of risk that the clients will leave. So it's really important to know where they stand, that distribution and not just the overall gross profit, not just the overall effective rate. So I, I assume this math got skewed during Q2, right? I mean, cause the, yeah, there was a spike, then it came down and then there's like now more or less people have been quiet to a degree. Now you're starting to find out which customers are, it have sustained right through the financial portion of this. Whenever you look at analysis, like which clients better or worse, you want to look at over a long period of time. Um, I, I would almost ignore the spike and the, and the dips. What I would know is that which clients might be gone for good. Um, those I would pay attention to quickly, but I wouldn't say I'm going to reprice an agreement because of what happened in November and in, in April, I'm sorry, in, in March and April. So, so what's a, a adequate amount of time? Is it six months? Is it eight months? Is it 12 months? Like, I, I would argue, and I've, uh, some of the clients we talked to, the analysis they do is every quarter, every month, they look at the trailing three months. The nature of the business is that it's spiky, that, MSPs are required to respond to issues as they arise, and they will arise. The theory being that not all clients have issues at the exact same time. And you're, it's an insurance policy. You're there for the extra 20 hours whenever they need it because something goes wrong. 
And hopefully that happens once a year and then the rest of the year makes up for it. So you look back at trailing three, trailing six months to see how that looks over a period of time. One month just isn't enough. Because of those spikes, that'll confuse you. And it's just, it's a one-off situation that you can write off. It's the trends. That's what you want to be aware of. Okay. So, you know, moving forward, right? Let's look at the rest of the year. Um, Cause again, you know, we're, you know, until 2020 is over and they start making movies about it, we're still in it. So what is your recommendations for your customers or for people, other MSPs out there to concentrate on between now and the end of the year, right? We talked about headcount. We talked about cash flow. We talked about client profitability. What else are we missing in terms of you know, what these guys should be concentrating themselves on? Well, it is, it is headcount. Um, that's a big one. Are you staffed appropriately? Um, we have done some work with clients where we looked at uh, how many, how much time are they putting in each month on a board on a daily basis? And then saying, okay, if you want 75% out of your people, let's say it's a 20 day month so that each person is going to work six hours a day. That's 120 hours per person. If you have 360 hours on a board, you need three people to staff it. If three months ago it was 600 hours, then you needed um, five people to staff it. So you need to have an understanding where you can move people around. I also think, again, this is so um, fluid. You need to understand how to staff. One of the things we noticed very early is that in a work from home environment, for a lot of people, tickets started coming in earlier in the day. It, it was more of, um, you know, not the office is open at 8.30, tickets start coming in then. Tickets were coming in at seven o'clock in the morning because somebody would wake up and they'd flip open their laptop and they wouldn't connect their VPN and they'd be pissed as all hell and they want to get somebody on the phone, but you are staffing at 8.30. So you have to think about how you should also change your staffing model to say, listen, I'm gonna give one individual the right to work from, you know, let's say seven to three instead of nine to five if you're giving them an eight hour day. So you could be more responsive to your clients. And again, you gotta look at that because July could be different than May. You just wanna keep following it, how to keep it staffed. So you wanna service your client well. You wanna staff appropriately in terms of headcount. And that's, you know, we built that report, I'll tell you that was like, it was one report I almost didn't want to put out because it was almost sad. Like we were building a report that might lead to headcount reduction. We never want to do that. Um, manage your cash flow, have a model, have a budget, and be able to adapt to that on a regular basis. I, I don't want to sort of over dramatize this, but this is war. You have to treat this like war. You have to sit there and have a a regular review of what's going on in your business. And as things change, you need to adapt to it quickly. This is not a quarterly planning type situation. This is a monthly or bi-weekly planning situation as things change. Because as I said, you know, some of these people that have 50,000 going on to 10, they'll live. The ones that go from 20 to negative five or 20 to zero, they need to be able to re adapt to say, listen, if I'm gonna lose money, I need to cut ahead so I don't go to zero. I still have to pay my family, pay myself. So it's what, regular reviewing of the numbers. What do you tell, like, or would you be surprised or would you, sh like, you know, obviously the more reoccurring services you have and the, the larger, the total amount of revenue you bring in that is reoccurring, generally the, 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 the better off you are, right? That's what we've all heard over the years. Mm -hmm. the, there's probably going to be an arrow back towards time and material and break fix a little bit now. Yeah, no, I mean, one of the things people try to do is that they, you want to cover your monthly nut with your monthly recurring revenue, or your margin off of that. That should cover all your overhead. So in theory, if you don't have any transactional business, you don't have any T&M, you don't have any physical products, you don't do any projects, you'd be break even. And then beyond that, you, you, know, you make your money. When you have a good project month, you have a good profitability month. We should accept that these people are going to see closer towards a break even because that transactional work. It's going to come back. Like computers are still going to become obsolete. Microsoft is still going to phase out their, their versions of Windows or whatever their, their office or whatever they need people to repurchase. Um, that's still going to happen. People are just delaying some of it. The business that go out of business don't need it all anymore. But I think that's going to come back. So you want to stay alive. Um, so for the so for the for the little bit of time that we have left, yes. You know, 
you, you obviously have had customers who have either acquired or have been acquired. Yes. So do you have an opinion on how this type of, you know, per client math and profitability planning helps or, or hurts that conversation? Well, if you can get ahead of it, it hurt, it helps it phenomenally well. Because if, if you're sitting there and you're saying, I want to sell my business in 12 months or two years, you're going to sell it based on, and I think from what I understand, people are moving much more towards an earnings based multiple rather than strictly a revenue based multiple where it used to be. You want to be more profitable and you should say, well, if I'm going to, if I'm making 12% margins, I'm worth X, but somebody's going to think a lot of me if I'm making 16% margins. So I'm not only going to make more because I'm making more money on every dollar I earn, but I might even get revenue expansion because whoever buys me is going to think I'm super sophisticated and worth more. Um, there's really a great return on that. And, you know, if you increase your, it would be an increase of profitability from 12 to, by a third, you might get 50% more of growth, but it's not something you do overnight. I have a, a friend who's a dermatologist and he tells me these, these kids come in and go say, well, I have a party coming up. Can you clear up my skin for the weekend? And he comes back to me and he's like, he's like, well, I mean, he's not snotty to them. He's a very polite person, but he looks at me after he tells me these stories. Like they should have been here six months ago getting a whole lineup of treatments. You can't fix this stuff in a couple of days. And the same is true. You can't fix an entire business in a couple of days. But if you make it like part of your regimen, I will evaluate my good and my bad clients. I will look at my agreements. I will make sure my engineers are constantly putting in time. I will, I will have the right conversations. You will see that trend up which will make you more attractive. So, so. you would, so the customers or the prospects that you look at where there's a lot of things that need to be fixed, what are the biggest items? Is it people are winging their time entry so that it's just off or it'll like, you know, what, what are the top three things that you run into when you look at a prospective uh, MSP that needs a lot of help? Uh, well, the biggest issue we always see, and we see this just like from anywhere from a million dollar to a $20 million MSP is they don't put all their costs in the system. Um, mm. in the PSA, it flows, the revenue flows into your accounting. It creates the invoices you pay taxes on it. That's always accurate. And if it isn't, then you've made a true mistake and you're not billing for your time. Costs don't flow anywhere. Like you put your vendor costs directly into your accounting system. Hopefully you have a good quoting program and it flows through, but if it doesn't, there's no real recourse. So we always see the issues in missing costs and we work with clients to address that. That's easy, that's a data issue. Where there's a structural issue and where I say, listen, we're data people, you really need to talk to a consultant or a coach and we, we work a lot with, or advise a lot to, to have people talk to C-Level, they've had a lot of success with this, is um, we say that we, we have a problem when people don't trust the PSA. If, I, if I'm an MSP and you're my client, and I do four hours of work for you under the recurring revenue agreement. You don't get an invoice for those four hours. They're economically covered by the agreement. Some people don't trust the PSA, so they don't enter the time or they write it off. That causes data problems and makes it harder to do analysis for truly written off time versus time. You just don't want to show up on an invoice. Um, so there are structural things that we ask clients to work on. Um, and then obviously people who don't enter their time, I don't know if it's because I'm working with more sophisticated clients than I used to, but we really don't see it that often anymore. Um, I think it's funny when we first started this, we talked to a, uh, this was five, six years ago. We talked to an MSP owner. He was a former military person. And he said, anybody who doesn't put their time in by five gets an email. If it's still not in by seven, the manager gets an email. If it's not in by seven the following morning. I get an email. I have a relationship with my employees. They do not want to hear from me at seven in the morning. I am not a pleasant person. I don't hear as much of that, but I, I am finding that people are much better at putting their time than they used to be. We don't find a lot of gaps anymore. That's good. I mean, that's one of the main things we hear about people who are coming from one system to another, or maybe they're growing, right? So they're coming from maybe a non-PSA to a PSA is that they find the system is too cumbersome to with, and then they're, people tend to wing their time entries, right? Where they kind of guesstimate when they did something rather than when they actually did it. And I can assume that that doesn't trickle up well. Well, it, the problem is twofold. One is like on an agreement, they could be sitting there thinking no harm, no foul because I'm not changing the revenue, but maybe it wasn't covered by the agreement. Maybe it's a remote agreement and you did on site, or some other 
billable type of work. So you need the discipline to get the time in and get it approved properly so that, you know, you don't miss that transactional, that you don't leave that money on the table. You're not giving your client stuff for free. Um, we have in our system and some people do leverage it, not everybody is a compensation program where engineers actually get a bonus based on how dollar productive they are. So if they don't put in time, they're not working towards the number. Um, different That's people do it different ways. Yeah. It's, it's almost like a comp plan for your engineers. It, it is. And it gives them the mentality that they should put in their time. They should be efficient with how they work things. They want to make sure that it's interesting because then you have somebody who puts in billable time and it hasn't yet shown up on an invoice to a client. The engineer is going to the manager saying, can you please finish that timesheet so I can get paid? And that's a complete role reversal where the manager is usually, you know, hitting the engineer saying, can you please finish your timesheet so that I can get this out on an invoice? It's a, mo it's a, it's a, a, a real alignment of interests between the company and the employees. Um, there's a whole yeah, process. I'm sure there, yeah, no, I'm sure there's a ton of people that will watch this that will ask what that plan looks like, right? Like on paper. I can, I'd be more than happy to show them the data. Again, this is something we built in conjunction or actually leverage the work done by, by sea level. So give them a call. Um, I don't know. I, I forget who takes the incoming calls. I think it's uh, Ken sponsor takes them now over there or we can talk to and show it to them. Just don't ask me to implement it. Don't ask me to have a conversation with engineers. I'm a numbers guy. I don't, you, you can attest to this. I'm not so good with people. Hey, everybody has their, has their thing, right? I mean, you're, you're the math guy. And I, I appreciate that because as much as I understand the math and trust me, I want to know it. Um, I'm, I'm a day to gay. I like to be in the trench, right? I like to like move the needle here and there and like in the day to day. So of course that person doesn't have enough time to look at, you know, all the math in the reports. They have other people like you <laughs> to put that together. So. Exactly. And, and listen, the, the, the point of the matter is it, it nothing that I've done in all the years that we've done this is not repeatable by somebody else. All the analysis that we've done, anybody could, you know, take the time and do all the work. As with all this outsourcing and with MSPs themselves, the truth of the matter is it's just easier to say, listen, for a fee, I'll let you do it. And I can focus on what I'm good at. Uh, I learned a long time ago, it's best not to muscle through things you don't enjoy. Let somebody else help you with that. Do what you're good at. Yeah. I've learned that over time. Sometimes it's best to surround yourself with the people that do the stuff that you either don't like to do or don't do well. So yes. I am right there with you. Larry, how do people find you? Um, like, let's say they want to get a hold of uh, an idea of that engineer comp plan, or they're interested in learning more about how to calculate their models or their, their profit of matrices. What, what, where's the best way to get a hold of you? Sure. You can come to our website. It's www.mspcfo.com. We have a contact link there. Um, we can have somebody from our team or myself speak to you. Um, and we'd ha be happy to talk through all this stuff. I mean, we really, I, I sincerely believe everybody in our team, and I know for a fact I do, we enjoy talking about this stuff. So we're happy to have a conversation. We're happy to go through. Uh, we do, uh, part of our process is before anybody signs up, we ask them to actually, or we, we prefer, they don't have to, we prefer that they actually demo what the information can show them. We do a one hour call. Um, where we show them what we see, and we'd be happy to do that with anyone. Uh, right now, we're only on ConnectWise Manage, but we've just begun actually this weekend pulling in data from Autotask. That's a beta program. Uh, we're not really selling that yet until we clean up all the data issues. Um, but yeah, if they want to talk to us, we're, we're more than happy to have a conversation. www.mspcfo.com. And then the other outfit you were talking about, C Level, uh, where do they find that? Uh, C Level Operations. Uh, I think it's C-levelops.com. Um, they're they're not they're not wilting flowers. They're usually present at most conferences. Um, really, really a sharp bunch of guys. Um, I will tell you that they have a. Uh, in my work with them, they have uh, a standards that they've been using, a standard they've been using, and, and playbooks, and they've been able to leverage. I think when I started with them, there were three consultants. I think now they're well into the double digits of FTEs that that help clients and. I've worked with a bunch of them and they've never been any complaints that I've heard. Uh, maybe they complain about them and I don't hear it. <laughs> well, I hear you, man. All good. Can't be everywhere at once. Appreciate no. your time, Larry. And thanks everybody for sticking in here. I know that this was a real, you know, kind of business level conversation. Not that we haven't had those before, but it really, you know, forces people to think about the math 
and I appreciate everybody for jumping on board. Again, MSP initiative is Tuesdays and Thursdays, one o'clock Eastern time. Of course, we record all these sessions. You'll see this online, you know, shortly after uh, this is over. Larry, when, when do you think we're going to see you next, my friend? Am I going to see, am I going to have to come to Connecticut to see you? I think it might be Zoom for the foreseeable future. Maybe we'll see you in, 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 in Denver. I would love to go to Denver, but I'm not sure if I'm ready. Uh, I mean, George, you, you, you know better than I do when these things are going to open up again. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, we're hearing about events in Phoenix and Vegas, but I just still don't like, listen, it's, it's one thing if it's me, right? If I have to actually get on a plane and it's on, it's on my back, but I'll tell you, a lot of my employees are super uncomfortable about getting on a plane right now. Yeah, no, they're, they're selling all the seats, aren't they? They're not really, they're not social distancing on planes. They talked about in the middle seat open and now that's uh, that's not happening. So it's very intriguing. Well, it on one. both ends because they have fewer flights. Right. So people want to get from point A to point B. If you tell them you have no seats, people are going to get pissed off about that too. Being in an airline is yeah. working with a lot of angry people. <laughs> well, Larry, let's, let's hope that the back end of the year ends up being calmer and we don't see a crazy second wave, but do hope that we see you soon in person. If not, stay in touch and thanks everybody for watching. Thank you for having me. Take care. You got it.